Next, we have Sophia Bush. Probably. on One Tree Hill and many shows, but she's equally an activist, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. And central to this conversation, she is the general partner and investor in Union Heritage Ventures. She's no stranger to Detroit, and she was first introduced to the city by her best friend, Nia Batts, who's our next panelist who will be joining us. (laughs) Nia is getting work done right now. Nia is a native Detroiter, and she's managing director and COO of Union Heritage, one of the nation's leading minority-owned diversified investment management companies. Uh, She's also launched the venture arm, Union Heritage Ventures, the only majority African-American-owned and majority women-owned venture capital firm in our great state of Michigan. So please (laughs) welcome our panelists and have a seat. Good morning. Everybody, <laughs> mics work? I mean, Hello. Hello. well, I'm the only person, obviously, who's having some challenges this morning. Uh, but I love this conversation. I love being here. Immediately when I was asked to come, I said, oh, yes. So I talked a little bit about each of your kind of backgrounds, but I want you all to give a better and fuller snapshot to this audience, particularly about how um, Detroit is important. Just a little snapshot, and we'll, and we'll talk a little bit and deep uh, dive deeper. But Peter, I'll start with you. Um, obviously, the investment, uh, incredible investment that you're leading here in Detroit. Tell us a little bit about that. So we, uh, we started, we've been part of Detroit for 80 years, but uh, really it was almost 11 years ago, summer of 2013 at the height of the bankruptcy when our chairman, uh, Jamie Dimon, asked me to come out and see if there's anything we can do to help. And uh, we just saw enormous, we saw the problems. I mean, we know it was, you know, 23% unemployment. The, the city had just entered bankruptcy. The, you know, the, the bu- there were no buses running on time. I mean, we saw all the problems. But we also saw enormous opportunity. We saw a, com- a community that had come together. And, you know, over the course of six months, we were a lot of people. And we made a decision to invest because we thought this was, not because simply it was the right thing to do, but we thought it was a smart thing to do. That if we could create a model here for how you actually bring a city back, it would be good for business, and it has proved to be the case. So, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Yes. Sophia? Well, I, you know, I'm very lucky. I claim Detroit as my home away from home because my, my mic is not working. Oh. I do this. Is it better? Yeah. I just need to get it closer to my face. Good thing from my day job, I'd be better at that part. Um, but, you know, I... All right, we'll, we'll just swap all together. I, um, I got lucky, you know, coming out here and getting to know the city with Mia, and our friendship really was rooted in activism from the start. You know, we met at a conference before conferences were like this. They weren't cool almost 20 years ago. Um, but we liked to go and take copious notes. And I think for me, you know, falling in love with this city as a friend coming to visit and spending so much time with Nia's family, you know, watching her younger siblings grow up, um, has been so exciting for me. And knowing the sort of great stories of America, the American dream, the idea of what you can do here. You know, my dad is an immigrant. My mom's mom was an immigrant. I grew up in Los Angeles, but I've been lucky enough to work all over the country and to see what investing in local economies can do, whether it is, you know, bringing television production or or coming in under the umbrella of finance is incredibly inspiring and exciting to me. I think it's how we build a modern and robust America today. And yeah, I just, I love it here. I'm I'm real long on Michigan. (laughs) We love it. And Nia, of course, you are a native Detroiter. Talk a little bit um, just about your vantage point. I mean, having seen Detroit over the years and now to to reach this point where you're able to invest so much into the city. Yeah, I mean, I love... Mine too? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Good? Mm Yeah. Yes, I was born and raised in Detroit. I love Detroit. And I did also what you're supposed to do as sort of the quote-unquote boomerang. It's you go and you might leave, but you're always supposed to kind of return and come back. And 
I remember maybe around 2010, 2012, when I was living and working in New York, working in entertainment, but ad-supported cable, and you have the big three here. And so I was spending a lot of time back here in Michigan and in Detroit. And I started to see friends that were here, friends that were coming back, and they were just building businesses very quickly. You'd have an idea, and just it was a coffee shop. It was a consulting business. And I was so incredibly drawn to that. And that was really the genesis of kind of the first business that we had here in Detroit, which was we decided to create a business that was a solution to a problem that we had. And then we built it. And that is the kind of energy, that kind of maker culture that's always been here. And it's so interesting now in this moment when we have these conversations about what does the future of innovation look like, we've always been an incredibly innovative, maker-driven city and community. And now we just have an opportunity to invest in think about new ways that we can contribute to that conversation. Excellent. And so uniquely, this panel is called inclusive investing and not impact <laughs> investing. Uh, and we had such a great conversation about the difference and like, you know, making sure, you know, particularly impact investing, there's the kind of a, a belief around it. But always be clear, you invest to make money. So wherever we're doing, that is the goal. But it's about how we go about doing it. So I would just love to kind of like entertain, like Peter, you know, you raised the point, like this is inclusive investing and the difference. Why is that so significant? Well, I, I think particular. I guess mine's the only one that works. I don't know what that's all about. Um, let me take this one off. So I, now this one doesn't work? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> Morning, panel. I don't panel. do this for a living. Um, you know, I think, and I, I'll think, I'll talk about this from the, perspective of a big company that has a lot of resources. And I think part of the challenges in corporate America for so long is we thought about this, let, we'll have an office of philanthropy and we'll have an office of impact investing and they'll go sprinkle a little money around and we'll do some press releases and we'll put a little shine on the fact that the rest of our businesses don't really operate in a way that brings more people in the, into the economy and creates more opportunity. And I think the difference is that we had a great chat about the other day is this has to be a fundamental part of our business strategy, not a separate thing that is, that is disconnected. And that's how we thought about our investment in Detroit. Not, you know, when, when we announced this in 2014, the first thing we said, this is not charity. This is about making an investment in a city that we are betting can come back and eventually will lead to business growth. And I think that has, for us, Detroit has transformed how we think about all of these things and how we think about the systems in place, particularly when you talk about finance, there is systemic racism within, you know, historically. And we have to look at how do you actually not have a separate office so you can say we did good things, but it didn't really change the systems. But how do you actually change the underlying systems so capital can be, can get to the people who, who want to create opportunities and do what, listen, what we see being done in Detroit every day. So that's why we make a very big distinction that this is very much part of our business strategy and getting more people into the economy, so a more inclusive economy, is a very important part of our business strategy. And Sophie, I see you nodding. It just makes me so happy because you are like the antithesis of the pale male and stale stereotype, so thank you. It, and, it, and it matters because we know, and, and I was so refreshed, as you said, when we had that conversation the other day, for some reason, when, you know, three of four of us walk in a room to talk about finance because we're women or women of color, people are like, oh, you're an impact thing. And it's like, hmm, why might you say that to us and not, not to Peter? That's so interesting. And it's really refreshing. It's like, we can't just be screaming into the void about how we're 51% of the population and thus should be also the economy. But we need you guys to help us do it. And I think people forget, you know, that a woman couldn't go into a bank and get a business loan without a male cosigner until 1988. People forget how much of a systemic shift is required to allow us all to participate. But what we see over and over again is that diverse managers outperform other managers, is that 
companies that have, um, let's say, a C-suite that looks like the four of us are going to have better return on investments than companies with homogenous C-suites. And so to your point, it is not just a moral imperative that we make room for women and for communities of color and for historically under-resourced geographies and sectors, but you're going to make more money. Everybody's going to make more money. So you can be a good person and do well at the same time. It should be a no-brainer, but, you know, we need more guys like you helping us do it. <laughs> yeah, I think we operate with a base-level assumption that, you know, with capital is power and you should be making investment decisions that are going to drive impact regardless. And so that is a metric that we utilize and evaluate and track, but that doesn't drive our strategy. It's endemic to our strategy, I guess, in, in some respects. And, you know, you often bring this up. What happens often with women is when they have resources, oftentimes you're asked to donate money as opposed to invest your money. And that was a trend we started to notice in our kind of mid-20s and some of the circles that we were running in. It was do you want to show up and support this cause? Do you want to make a donation? And what we started to see is that there was also another exchange that was happening that we weren't initially a part of, which was, here's a deal that you should look at. Here's an opportunity to invest early on in my company, and here's some additional information that's going to help you understand what the growth of that business is going to look like. And so we were observing those behaviors, and you start to see that as, you know, Peter was saying, it exists in systems as well. You know, systems are built to support processes and how you develop and inform the processes are what you're continuing to perpetuate. And capital is certainly, you know, an example of that. And so Sophia also talked about, you know, the importance of diverse allocators, diverse fund managers. And for us also, that's a competitive advantage. We are value creators. We invest in, in value. We've been doing that for 35 years in the public markets, and we see an undervalued community of entrepreneurs. We see new approaches to businesses and solving problems that some people are missing because they're not really thinking about the true TAM or the opportunities to super serve those that may not be the first ones that we think of. And so your perspective and the way in which you approach a problem is incredibly important, and oftentimes that's where the value is, but you have to also believe that there's value there. And in the conversation in Detroit, whether or underrepresented communities, that's always this tension with the word impact for us because on some level, it's almost as though the assumption is you're not going to generate value or excess returns, and we just think just the opposite. I couldn't agree more. And CTA, we have our $10 million fund, and we say, like, we are here to make money, and we're going to women in diverse funds because they're seeing deals you're not seeing. And so that's a competitive advantage for us. Uh, but to your other point, you know, when it's philanthropic, when budgets, you know, get cut, it's one of the first things. So making sure that it's an investment that benefits everyone um, is central. So $200 million, Peter, <laughs> plus more. I mean, one, it, it came at such an incredible and important time. And a lot of what we're seeing in Detroit now is because of that initial $200 million investment from J.P. Morgan. So I'll just say a couple things. When we came in in 2013, you know, I'm not, this is not a newsflash, a lot was broken. And part of it, you didn't, we talked about systems, you didn't have the systems in place. There weren't the systems in place here that actually would allow, that would encourage the kind of investment we want. And so one of our big early focuses, was how, which is what you actually need philanthropic capital. How do you actually create those systems? And I'll, I'll give you just two examples. One was the workforce system. You didn't, you had this disconnect. You, you know, there were half, a quarter of the Detroit's population was unemployed and there, were, there weren't jobs being created in the city. So understanding where the jobs are, how do you connect employers to job seekers? One of the earliest investments we made is now what's Detroit at Work, which has been a phenomenal uh, addition to the city in terms of working with, and in fact, one of the points I'll make we created, I was telling Josh this this morning, just in Corktown, 
a virtual call center. So we now have 100 Corktown residents who are managing a million dollars in call volume a year. Aroda over here runs it for us. Out of their homes, these are virtual employees. We actually do recognize that there are some jobs that can be done virtually. And they're actually beating the metrics of our brick and mortar call center. So we are actually getting better value out of call center employees in Detroit, in many cases who are out of Orlando and the Philippines and Arizona. And so there is this, there is incredible talent. I mean, this is when we talk about, there's incredible talent sitting in, in communities that are so often overlooked. We could not have done that without Detroit at work. I'm getting some nods from my colleagues. The other thing we were talking about, you know, one of the challenges when we first came in, there was all this development money coming in some of it was for dealing with the, you know, knocking down vacant properties, but a lot of the black and brown and women entrepreneurs who wanted to be part of that could not get capital. Yeah. Working with Mayor Duggan, he said that I need to create a system, and we created a program called the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund, which we talked about the other day, which, you know, these are people who could not get normal financing from companies. In the first two years, we had two defaults. That's a pretty good... It is, now, it is now a program that we've actually replicated in 12 cities around, around the country. And so thinking about how do you actually create the systems, and I would say for us as a, you know, the, the, I don't know if we want to get into the impact, but the result for our business, our business is booming in the city of Detroit. Our deposits in the last 10 years are up $20 billion. Our consumer balances are up. Our business balances are up. That's a good thing for our shareholders. So anyone who says this is some separate thing from your business strategy, this is about shareholder value. And I think demonstrating that you can, when you invest in overlooked communities, there's so much talent, there's so much innovation sitting there. And if you bring it out, it's good for it. Listen, it's good for our company. It's good for the city and it's good for the. And I Jamie Diamond's newsletter um, to shareholders. And it speaks to your point, um, what we're discussing. It has to be part of your DNA. It can't be an add-on. Uh, but he says, helping to create a stronger, more inclusive economy and making investments in cities like Detroit that show how business and government leaders can work together to solve problems. Like, it is incredible, but it is a partnership. Yeah. And we, um, and I'll, I, I want to give, we won't invest in, the partnerships that we saw, this is what we saw when we came in, in in you know 2013 and 14, you know we saw a mayor who was who came in saying, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat or you know black, brown, white or yellow. If you're if you're if you want to be part of the city's resurgence, we want to work with you. We saw incredible organizations, and listen, the city had sort of hit a low, and and it was the people who said we are going to chart a different course. And at the end of the day, for all the numbers and all the statistics, you're investing in the people and the bet we were making in every way possible was on the people of the city. Incredible. You talked a little bit about some of the challenges and then kind of learnings or, or outcomes. Can you share any more? Some well, I mean, listen, the, in terms of the outcomes, look, you've got, you know, GDP among, among Detroit residents is up 23%. Unemployment is now less than 7%. One of the things, one of the statistics I like the most, we have now cut in half in 10 years the number of people in the city of Detroit who didn't have access to the banking system. And so like, and this again, I can show you, and listen, you add to it Moody's and you add to it the census. I mean, you add to so many statistics what this city has done. And then you look at how our business is doing. And look, here was the alternative. If we just said, okay, there were a lot, I mean, to your points earlier, changing these systems is hard. There are a lot of people who are very invested in how things are currently done. And when I went back after six months and said to Jamie and our operating committee, I think we can invest $100 million, I was very lucky that the cool winds of democracy had not blown through J.P. Morgan Chase because the vote would have been about, you know, 90 to 1 saying, don't do it. This doesn't make any sense. And Jamie said, we have to try. And listen, and, and we did. So the fact is we have to keep working on it. And when, when you can show that a city's economic growth matches a company's economic growth. And I, will, I don't like to name competitors in here, but we've got competitors who are opening offices here for the first time in 30 years. That's a sign that there, there is enormous opportunity. And this is something that we're now replicating 
uh, in places around the country. And I will, last thing I'll say, because um, the, the country is so divided right now. And, you know, putting aside politics, it's divided because there are a lot of people who have been passed over, people in cities, people in rural areas. And this is for companies. If we don't solve these divisions, this is terrible for the business climate. And so we have to look for ways and look for partners who will work with us to try to solve this. And this is what you don't see it in Washington every day. You see it in cities and states. And that's why we're so proud of the work we're doing here. Wonderful. So, Nia, Detroit is in your DNA. You are a native, uh, native Detroiter. And I loved learning more about your family history and like kind of, you know, family businesses in Detroit are incredibly important. And you bridging the traditional with the new, particularly going into venture. Can you talk a little bit about Union Heritage? Yes, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, our managing partner and chief investment officer, Derek Bass, also my father, is <laughs> Peak dad. If you ever want to find my dad when we're on stage, literally he has his phone out and he's like the happiest person ever. And I think that's just a function of the fact that like my dad gets up and works every day and he's just happy every day. He loves what he does. And 35 years ago, he founded Union Heritage here in Detroit and we had been managing on the public side, public pension funds, um, institutional capital into a public market strategy. And the idea was that working people deserve the same level of discipline and rigor to their investment portfolio to provide and, you know, or safeguard really hopes and dreams for their families. And like, so we have really internalized the legacy of that respect. And it's named, you know, in honor of my grandparents who were all union workers. And what we love so much about being in this building is that before it was the book depository, it was actually the main post office. And my grandfather was a mail clerk and he worked in this building. Mm -hmm. And when we launched Union Heritage Ventures, our venture capital arm, two years ago after you know, a decade of angel investing, you know, we spent some time to really listen and learn from the ecosystem. And we love right now that on the third floor here is where you will find our headquarters for Union Heritage Ventures. And as you were saying, many firsts, first African-American venture capital firm this majority held and majority owned by women. And um, it feels really special to be able to do that. It feels very important, but it really connects us to the, the why we do what we do, and it's really for the people. And Sophia you know, alluded to that as well. Like We're activists by nature, and we're in this work because we believe that capital can really solve problems and make people's lives better. Mm -hmm. um, we also think about our philanthropy as philanthropic investment. And so I love Peter so much about, like there's a role for philanthropy, but I also love the way that you guys engage in that work. You're creating systems that are gonna be able to continue to drive value and other people can build around because all we needed was someone to step up and help us figure out what the train tracks looked like so that more good ideas could kind of travel down them. Mm -hmm. And so we have those three sort of branches of our firm, and I'm very happy to serve as our, I have the opportunity to touch all of them. And I do most of my work here from this building and makes it very easy to go to meetings for our portfolio companies because many of them are in the building and also some new companies that we're looking at as well. So we're really excited to be here. I love that. And Sophia, I, I love it. You have your best friend, and she's like, come home with me. And now you're a general, general partner at Union Heritage. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that journey and why Detroit was so significant? Yeah, well, very much in the way that we talk about the why, for us, I think, you know, similarly to you, what you were saying about philanthropic investment, when we met at a conference in our 20s, we, we were just, you know, idealistic kids looking around going, we can absolutely change the world, right? And, and when we thought about how to do that, our, our first uh, steps through the door were through cause work. They were through philanthropy. That then led us into politics and, and true activism because, you know, anybody who says they don't do politics, I'm like, well, politics is doing you and the rest of us every day. Like everything is political, the roads we drive on outside and, 
and the systems that we live in. And so how do we design a better future for our communities? And as we really started to look at policy, uh, you know, philanthropy led us to policy and it's impossible to learn about policy and how these systems are built without consistently coming back to money because capital is power. And when we think about places where we have the sorts of disparities we were referencing earlier, whether you know, it was the state that you found Detroit in when J.P. Morgan came in, whether it's you know, in one of my other favorite cities that often gets flown over and should not, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Nehemiah Frank is here from the Black Wall Street Times. You know, cities like ours often suffer from disparity because of those root causes that are financial, political, historic. Um, and so for us, when we started a business here, again, to solve a problem, we were young women working in media. We couldn't get our hair done together. We were like, well, the beauty industry is racist. What are we going to do about it? We'll go and start this business together in Detroit and solve a problem. And it wasn't lost on us that as women who come from media, we experience certain levels of privilege. But as small business owners in a burgeoning city, we also experienced small business owner hardships. And when we really looked across the landscape, we saw how many female entrepreneurs and then particularly female entrepreneurs of color were having a hard time accessing capital. And it really took us back to that, you know, wonderful Desmond Tutu adage, like, you're only going to pull people out of the river for so long until you go upstream and figure out who's pushing them in. And you, if you want to teach a man to fish, the other wonderful adage that is so true, you have to figure out how to give people the resources to do so. And so for us, we really were able to take, you know, a decade and a half of experience as entrepreneurs, storytellers, and investors and start to look at a much bigger dream and a bigger potential. And we realized, well, if not us, then who? So here we are. Yeah. I just also wanted to jump in and kind of give Peter and JP Morgan like their flowers. Like when we talk about the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund, our business was actually one of the first recipients of it as well. It enabled us to take out a construction loan to actually build the physical space that was needed for our business. And we're incredibly grateful for that. Yes, and we so came and know. we came in on time and under budget, I would like to say, which is rare in construction, but thank you. Yes, but Can I, oh. no, no, go ahead. You finish. Well, I was gonna You want to say more about JP Morgan, that's fine. <laughs> I don't want to do it. Go on, go on. But, but what I was gonna say is unfortunately that business was a COVID casualty. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. There are ups and downs in business, and especially for us as early stage investors, you have to be comfortable tolerating risk and getting comfortable with it. Because we've got a public market business that's very conservative, we can take more risk here in early stage Michigan and really sort of focus because we've spent 35 years being disciplined enough to understand how to take that risk. And that's what JP Morgan did as well. Like they came in and said, we're gonna take the risk. Everything is not gonna be philanthropy. Like it was debt. We had a business relationship and we had to reconcile that relationship on the back end. But I don't know if it wasn't for us building that with the support of J.P. Morgan and, and various partners around the city and investors that we would have felt so called to make sure that the next thing we did was hyper local. Because there were lots of plate we could have built a national fund, but we all said it has to be here first. The first one has to be here. So oh, I'll, just, I'll be quick, I promise. But I, but, no, but I think this conversation about how capital, not only how capital is allocated, but how you're using different forms of capital is so important, and it doesn't occur in most cities right now. Because usually you got people saying, just, just throw money at the problem. And the problem in Detroit wasn't money. There was a lot of money being thrown at Detroit for years. But when we first came in, there was literally no market rate and market level capital coming into the city. And you saw, Invest Detroit has a great chart to show over the years that you're seeing when we did the Scott building next to Little Caesars, you started half the project with market rate. How do you begin to think about that trajectory of where philanthropic capital plays a role, where low, lower cost capital plays a role? And ultimately, if you want something sustainable, you have to be able to bring in this market rate capital, which is what you're seeing in Detroit today. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we're seeing that conversation even happen like within the early stage venture ecosystem, right? Like there has to be a role for the nonprofit venture model and traditional market venture because that's also what accelerates investment from the coast to come into Michigan. It de-risks Michigan for them because they understand that the investors are um, benchmarking against you know, the, the same sort of metrics that they are as well. They're modeling growth similarly. And so we definitely need these blended models, mm -hmm. a nonprofit venture, traditional venture, um, debt instruments, but it's really this sort of collective-based approach that I think we're working through here in Detroit and in Michigan and getting better at every day that is really what makes us special. And what's exciting about it is creating a robust system like this allows for more and more people to access it and be a part of it. And that's really the goal. You know, we, we're not really interested in doing more of the same. We're really interested in making bigger buckets, building bigger tables. And it does feel like so much of the spirit of this city, it is generative, as you said earlier, and it's so exciting to be a part of it. And, you know, we, we met some data scientists backstage and like, I just, I love the data. I love the 10 year report. I'm like, please give me all the stats. It's really, really wonderful to see it not just, again, you know, emotionally or morally, but it's nice to see that the math is mathing. So um, women receive less than 2% of venture funding. That's one of the reasons why our fund was so important. Uh, entrepreneurs of color, even less. Uh, so I was excited. I heard some announcements uh, from the state of Michigan regarding venture funding. And I know we're going to hear from uh, Michigan Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist a little later in the program, but I do have to shout out his work and the work of MEDC, not just about attracting new businesses, but supporting the ones that are already here in Michigan. Um, at CES, the team is always there talking about why Michigan is the place to start your business or invest. So they made an announcement recently uh, that they've been approved an investment to support Union Heritage's Future Heritage Fund, uh, which will target uh, socially and economically disenfranchised uh, individuals own businesses and very small businesses. First, congratulations. That's incredible. So that's recent news, but like, what's your vision for that? Yeah, so we, as you said, are, we're incredibly grateful to, um, to the state, to the governor, to the lieutenant governor, everyone at the MEDC, the Michigan Strategic Fund Board for their support. And, you know, when we talk about addressing the issues and the, the barriers to entry into venture, the state, I think, really understands that and is trying to be sort of solutions oriented. When we talk about barriers to entry, it could be anything from track record or the, just these various qualifications for emerging managers. And so it is really a vote of confidence that the state has said, we understand that these are not first time managers. This is an institutional firm with 35 years of experience. What we have to make sure that we do is help eliminate the barriers to entry for these types of firms so that we have more of them. So again, it's like when you understand that like we're the first in all of these respects, there's a reason. It's because it's very hard to do. So I, I do feel very proud of the team for getting to this point mm -hmm. and for doing everything we can to keep the door open for other firms that come behind us because there needs to be more representation. And so much of the thesis is about underrepresentation. So whether that's women, people of color, people in rural areas, military veterans, members of the LGBTQIA community, we're actively looking and searching to make sure across the state of Michigan that we're not missing those founders. If we find those founders, what stage of growth are they in? How can we help to reduce friction and eliminate barriers for their growth in this Michigan ecosystem? Because if we can get it right here, these are also innovations that can translate into other markets. So we're proud to really dig in and do that work and to spend some time, not just here in Michigan, but really across the state as well. Excellent. And if we get it right here in Detroit, there's no need to go to Silicon Valley. There's no need to go to New York. You can stay in Detroit and build your business. Yes. yes. We're going to recruit Peter here. <laughs> so 
you know, I love we're talking about all of the like wonderful things that are happening, but I, everything isn't great. I mean, you talked about the closed closure during COVID. So many companies suffered. And so while Detroit has some unique challenges, which I do want to surface and maybe even talk about some solutions, there's something uniquely special about Detroit, too, that brings people in. So I want to kind of have that conversation. I mean, let's talk about the challenges and, and more importantly, how we're approaching and overcoming when it comes to investing here in Detroit or, you know, if you're trying to build a workforce. But also, from your experience, why are people gravitating towards Detroit and are willing to bet on Detroit despite those challenges? I'll jump in, everyone. I mean, listen, I... I I'll sort of double down on this. I, we were having a conversation at the J.P. Morgan Operating Committee recently about why some of our investments went south. We don't always get it right. And this, wasn't, this had nothing to do with Detroit. And for all the sort of statistics and numbers and data, it was about the people you're investing. And I really do think at the end of the day, for all the numbers and all the data, this came down to the people of the city. And the, the sense of, of collaboration, the sense of leadership. And I'll tell you, I, I was thinking about this last night. We were, we were wandering, my colleagues, uh, Shannon and Steve, we were wandering around at the concert last night. And for every metric I can cite about why this investment has been a success for us, I'm, I don't know, I can't quantify this, but to see the pride on the faces of people in that crowd yesterday, because the, what their faces were, this is our city. And that, you can't, I can't put a number on that, but at the end of the day, that's what you're, that's the kind of secret sauce that you have to find. Are these people you want to work with? Are these people who are going to be with you from thick and thin? And I think that, for us, that's the special thing about this city. And that's, listen, my colleague, Aroda, who started her career with, with Chase in Orlando and then moved to Houston, when we were setting up, she raised her hand and said, I'm, I want to move to Detroit. I want to be part of that. And she's now leading a team of 100 people sitting in the city. And, and I think it's because of the people of this. And she just got married. I'm going to oh, keep embarrassing her. Congratulations. Um, but, you know, but that, I, I honestly think at the end of the day, you sit across a table and you say, is this someone I actually want to work with? Are they, they're going to be tough times. Things are going to go wrong. And are we going to be in this together? And I think that's, to me, that's the secret sauce of Detroit. And that spirit of collaboration is so inspiring. It's part of, you know, the reason that I love this place and I love to be here as often as I can. And, and even here within this building, you know, where our legacy is, where we are envisioning from, you know, the history of Nia's family and the legacy of this city, we're, we're envisioning a new future and what we can do, you know, as women and as entrepreneurs to see some of the challenges and the way the collaborative spirit of this place responds to them inspires me. You know, is it frustrating for us to know that typically it takes a founder here 24 months longer to raise $500,000 in capital than it does on the coast? Yes, that's immensely frustrating. It's part of why we do what we do. But when you see founders and particularly founders of color in this city saying, there's something going on here that, that we're obviously missing. We're not, we don't have access to something. What is it? And they start Black Tech Saturdays in this building, and it grows from five entrepreneurs to 75 entrepreneurs gathering and sharing information and resources. And like the ideas and the innovations that iterate out of this space because people are saying, oh, no, we're not trying to gatekeep. We want to help each other get ahead we believe that we'll go farther together. That is incredibly inspiring, I think, for anyone in any vertical of business to witness and, and to want to be a part of. Oh, please, no, I was gonna say, well, I know we, I'm watching this clock over here, and I know we've had some <laughs> questions uh, okay. from the audience, but I want to make sure you make your point. Well, I'm gonna ask an open-ended question, uh, and actually it was one of my last questions, uh, particularly advice for entrepreneurs and investors, but we have some questions from the audience. I've been learning that in order to serve underrepresented founders, we need to create space for them. Are there any actions or metrics you're implementing today to make that space uh, in any area that traditionally doesn't? 
Mm. I'm just want to make sure I understand the question. How to make space for underrepresented founders? Yes. Okay. I mean, I think Sophia touched on a good point. The, the first thing is to, to be in spaces with under, other underrepresented founders. And Black Tech Saturdays is an incredibly, op- incredibly great opportunity to do that. And a rich that is generative, and it was for that purpose, was to come together, organize, and figure out, are we asking each other, do we need the same uh, things from the ecosystem, and can we learn together? Um, I also think, you know, allocators are important. Underrepresented founders need to also speak to underrepresented allocators, and there's not as many of us in the state, but, you know, we're trying to do the best that we can. Um, you know, we have some members of our team, Josh Tuker, who's our um, head of SVP of research and, and runs the portfolio with my dad, is an incredible resource. He is so generous with his time. He's here in the back, and he is always more than willing to sit with folks and to help them figure out what the next best action is, even if they aren't ready for investment. You know, there are other firms that might say, you're not ready, and come back when you're ready. We don't say that. We say, you might not be ready for this vehicle right now, but here are some non-dilutive you know, capital opportunities that you might want to seek because when we write a check, we're going to take a piece of, of the company. We might say, here's a new way of thinking about um, tracking and developing metrics that are to teach to the test in some respects, that are going to be what these other firms are, are looking for. And so I think just really understanding the ecosystem and how to move through it and as an underrepresented founder doing that in community and understanding that other people have asked the question before you have. Like, there are some pathways that exist, and it's just kind of make sure that you can get on them. Um, But if you can't find them, um, come to us, and we will happily sort of point you in what you think is, you know, a good direction. And I'm glad you mentioned Black Tech Saturdays here. And also, you know, that's what we try to You want to find community. You want to find people uh, whether, you know, it's women in tech or under you know, LGBT and allies, you just want to kind of understand that there's someone there that has a, there's a common kind of part or experience that you all can have shared experience and, and, and possibly best practices. So that is incredibly important. I'm glad that that's happening here at Michigan yeah. Central. And Phomology, Megan Ward's organization is another great one that's mm-hmm. also like based here as well. And another question we received, but I think we answered uh, how do we attract companies here and or retain the amazing talent? I think you've talked about it. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think you attract companies by the talent. I mean, that if when, you know, we can make a decision in New York that we're going to open a call center, open branches, but, but uh, this is where, you know, I mentioned Detroit at work, understanding how you keep, it's not just, it's not just importing talent, but growing talent. And that's, I mean, to me, the, the, the special thing here is you have a lot of talent sitting in, you know, Corktown and in neighborhoods of the city who, don't, who haven't traditionally gotten the opportunities. And I remember the first time I met Mayor Duggan, this was like right after he took office, and we were talking about what we were doing, he said, the city can't come back until the neighborhoods come back. And I think focusing on talent, this is not just about downtown. Focusing on talent sitting in, the, in neighborhoods and creating the opportunity for them and giving them a chance to grow. And listen, I think the fact when you talk about attracting talent, it's good wrestling. You know, the fact the Lions are doing well is not bad. And the fact that you got, I mean, no, those are people, people live where you've got good restaurant scenes, great food. you got the, the bikeways and the, and the parks. I mean, the, this is all a big part of how do you create a place that people want to live and grow and raise their families. Yeah. And I think I, you've got, you're getting that. Figure. There was um, Travel Noir, who's like a, a national kind of travel mag, had an article that came out this week, and they said Detroit's vibe is unmatched, and that's like truly how we feel. Like, yes, it's it's the it's the best place. It's like we have the best food, we have the best people, we have the best companies. We're building like cool things, like just vibe unmatched. You know, I think that's generally great to close on. There, the math works, the money works. You're going to make it. But those that intangible pride that we have in Detroit, and having people who want to come here, um, that is, um, it's palatable. It may not be something you can write down on a balance sheet, but um, it's real. So, please uh, join me in thanking our wonderful panel, Nia, Sophia.
Peter, thank you so much. Thank you. But this is really about um, less words, words, but mostly, and most importantly, actions and dollars. So thank you for everything that you all do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One truth about the maritime domain is it's very fragmented. Every port operates differently.